Hello and welcome to Management 201. Today we'll talk about our second topic, uh, essential business environment, and we'll be looking at the external environment, things like uh, technology, customers, industry factors, and internal environment of business as well, things like your know, organizational culture, resources capabilities, and how those affect the business. We would also touch upon things like organizational ethics and making sure that the decisions that you make within a company are considerate of the interests of the people inside the firm, people who own the firm, but also a lot of people who are affected by the company. And that is a very uh, essential task, I would say, for the decision makers, because the society the rules have changed, people's expectations have changed, and companies are expected to be socially responsible they are expected to uh, take the bigger picture into account and all the terminology of corporate social responsibility and social entrepreneurship is now a big part of our day-to-day -day lives. So we need to understand why companies do that, what are different approaches for doing that, and uh, you know what it means for the companies and, and for how we make decisions and the implications those decisions have. So very briefly, we will look at uh, several elements, right? The environment, both internal and external, organizational culture, the way it manifests, uh, different kinds of organizational culture, uh, strength, health of organizational culture, and what especially we need to be paying attention to when describing the culture, ethics and ensuring ethical behaviors, we would also discuss why people sometimes engage in unethical behavior because uh, you know we may think that those are just all bad people but in reality i think if you analyze your own life uh, there will be situations where the choices you make could be called into question so uh, and all of us we tend to think of ourselves as decent people so understanding why people make those choices is essential because uh, you know you'll be dealing with people throughout your professional careers and uh, understanding people intentions and drivers of their behavior is uh, important and then as i said we'll talk on corporate social responsibility i may not necessarily go into deep detail over there but i will highlight certain aspects that i believe are essential for us uh, to know and agree on and, uh, you know, some of those elements will appear on the quiz and later on the exam. So uh, I'm trying to provide some extrinsic motivation for you guys as well to pay attention. So first, uh, we're going to start with the internal environment of firms. Basically, internal environment refers to all the factors that operate, uh, that exist within the organizational boundaries. So it could be things like systems processes Every company deals with certain inputs, right? Company would buy some resources, they would hire people. They would then try to transform those inputs into something meaningful, some outputs that they will try to deliver to the market. They would try to sell to customers, be that individuals or other businesses. So the inputs, the transformation processes and outputs are kind of easy to understand. Right, this is what companies are all about. They are systems for transforming inputs into outputs. What gets left out of the picture quite often is the notion of feedback. Right, Whenever you work with real customers, whenever you provide your outputs to whoever it is you're working with, you do receive feedback. It may be loud and clear. People may, people may file a complaint if something is wrong. They may you know, state their appreciation for what you do. Uh, there are also more subtle ways of providing feedback. And some of those would be really essential for your success as a business. So word of mouth would be considered one of the types of feedback. If people are happy with your products, with your outputs, and they share the word about it with uh, their friends or their clients or their partners, that will definitely help uh, to ensure sustainability and long-term success for your company. So at the systems level, 
when you think about the internal environment, you have to consider not just input transformation and output, but also the feedback process and how you can incorporate that feedback into improving your internal environment. That is very essential. There is also organizational structure. Uh, companies could be structured in a great number of different ways. We will have a session later on this semester when we will discuss some of the key formal structures, the, the you know, sort of the archetypes, if you will. We'll discuss the pros and cons of each of them, and I will identify some of the challenges associated with this structure. But basically, you probably know that there's a big difference between some flat organization where there are no those formal layers of management and people can approach anyone within the company. And if they have a great idea, they may start their own project and become a project leader and uh, you know do any number of great initiatives within the company. Yet some other companies are extremely formal. They have those departments and all the information has to travel through uh, proper information channels. Uh, and uh, you know some companies like General Electric uh, at some point in their history had as many as 27 different layers of management. So obviously this is a diversified company, so it's not representative of how most other companies uh, operate or, or interact with uh, their clients and the outside world. But the thing is, the structure that exists within the company determines, dictates the logic of the processes within the company and determines as such the internal environment within your business. So structure is important. Resources are absolutely key element of the internal environment. And uh, resources is kind of a, uh, you know, very broad term. So it's not just physical resources, it's also human resources, technology, human resources, financial resources, but it's also uh, things of a different nature, right? Your capabilities, what you can do with those resources, because you can easily imagine two companies that are endowed with identical sets of resources, yet one performs fantastic, fantastically, and the other one struggles to keep the customers or find the customers. So it's not just the resources as such, it's also capabilities and competencies that you develop to utilize those resources to meet your organizational goals. That to a significant extent is determined by your management and culture. And we'll have a separate se uh, session on that. Uh, this course is actually fairly rich with respect to the content that it covers. So, but uh, you know, management is kind of this formal side of the soft uh, internal environment. Culture is the informal side. It's very hard to define, but uh, you just know that some firms, you know, the, the atmosphere in those firms resonate with you. Other companies, everything seems to be in order, but you feel uncomfortable there. So we'll talk about what defines organizational culture today, uh, the different kinds of culture. For now, just keep in mind that culture and management are very important elements of the internal environment. And then finally, something that gives the organization purpose, its mission. Individuals working in a company have to have the mission uh, internalized, if you will. They have to know why they do what they do. They have to know what the company they work for stands for. It is essential. Companies without a mission will never be able to perform as effectively as, as the one where people subscribe to the same idea, to the same uh, final goal. So mission affects what happens within the company, how employees identify with the company. And because of that, it affects your internal processes how resources are utilized, what kind of capabilities are developed, what structures are put in place, and the system processes as well, uh, most notably the feedback element, right? Depending on the organizational culture, 
companies may or may not uh, utilize the feedback they receive effectively. So mission, culture are absolutely essential elements. Now, external environment. This is something that obviously exists outside of the company, outside of the firm. And you can look at that at several different levels. Uh, your textbook talks about two different groups of factors, the task factors and the general factors. Elsewhere in the management literature, uh, task factors would be called uh, sort of the industry level factors or industry environment, whereas general factors would be called uh, just general environment. And the idea here is that the general factors, they would affect all firms in all industries. Task factors or industry factors are unique only to the industry within which a firm operates. And you have to understand the difference between these two. Uh, it's probably safe to say that you should be paying closer attention to the task factors, to the industry environment, because firms that operate in that same industry, they are subject to the same environmental constraints as your company. They probably have resources that are similar to your firm's resources. And because of that, the strategies they will be pursuing may be quite similar. They may go after the same kind of customers. They may utilize similar processes. And because of that, it is with those firms that you compete for whatever pie you have to share in that industry. So when we talk about those task factors or industry specific factors, what do they include? So customers, obviously you have to understand who your customers are, what it is that they want and uh, how you can possibly utilize your resources, capabilities and competencies to satisfy that. Uh, profitably and how you can sustain the level of profitability over the long run. You also look at competition. You have to understand who your competitors are, what drives their actions and responses to, to, to your actions. And you have to be able to predict what they likely to do. There are many instruments and tools that you can employ to make those predictions more or less accurately, but um, you know, if you've heard about uh, sort of business intelligence or, or competitive intelligence, that's, that's one element that helps you figure out what's going on. So you have to understand a lot about their strategic goals, about their assumptions, their resources, where they're going, uh, what's important to the leadership. So all of that is essential. And basically you can have the environment, industry environment that may be highly competitive, this is when you have a very intense rivalry or the industry or rivalry is kind of benign. It doesn't mean that, you know, you are the only company there, but companies in those kind of industries are careful not to step on each other's toes because they understand if they start competing really intensely, customers will win, but they, the companies themselves, will probably lose on a balance. You have to understand your suppliers. There are some industries where suppliers are very powerful and they can demand whatever prices they want. They can put pressure on you both financially and strategically. So you have to really understand uh, what it is that uh, determines that level of bargaining power that exists in, among your suppliers. You also pay attention to the labor force. Right. So people, as we say, they are an extremely important part of your business. Resources themselves, you know, like physical resources or financial, it's all important, it's all well and good, but it's really the people who are making the difference. So you've got to understand uh, what people within your industry are like, what motivates them, what their expectations are, and what are some of the standard practices that other companies use to get the best employees, to retain them, to train them, and to develop them, right? Because this is what your employees will expect. At the very least, you have to meet their expectations. If you want to be truly successful, you need to exceed those to have committed employees uh, at your company. So you've got to have a great understanding of the labor force within your industry. 
And you may think that, you know, labor is labor, people are people, but realistically speaking, you know, people who work for IT are not quite the same individuals who would work at, uh, in the farming industry, right? So we all have the need to be motivated, but the tools you engage, uh, the, the motivators you're involved would differ greatly between uh, industries and you have to be cognizant of that. And so the big problem here is uh, if your company has recently been through a top leadership change and a new leader comes from elsewhere who is unfamiliar with the practices and conventions within your industry, there may be terrible mistakes made. So uh, this is something you definitely have to watch, something you need to pay very close attention to. Shareholders obviously are important, right? You uh, exist as a company to basically make them rich and make them happy. Uh, previously, it was primarily about making them rich. Currently, there is, as I said, a lot of talk of being socially responsible. So sometimes companies choose strategic actions that are not exactly in line with their short-term profitability but they definitely help the company establish itself as a um, you know, valuable player within that industry. And uh, so sometimes companies sacrifice some of the short-term gains for long-term opportunities. And uh, depending on who your shareholders are, you may have to emphasize different elements of this trade-off, right? So essential. The general factors or the general environment are the ones that affect all firms and all industries. They include things like societal changes, technological changes, economic changes, governmental changes, like different regulations. And uh, you primarily pay attention to that because any kind of change there may create an opportunity for you to pursue or may pose a strong environmental threat. So if you think about the COVID pandemic, no one really anticipated it a year ago. Uh, companies are responding to it in a different ways. And for some companies like Zoom, that was a terrific opportunity. All of a sudden people realize that even though we are all locked down at our homes, we can still do work. We can still meet with other people we can still function semi-normally. For other companies like airlines, obviously this is a huge problem, this is a huge threat. So you have to be watching the trends among those general factors and try to understand what those changes mean for your company, right? So the trends again are not specific to your industry and even within the same industry, Firms may respond to those changes differently, like, um, you know, say fitness industry, uh, different athletic clubs. A lot of companies have closed down as a result of this crisis, the, the COVID pandemic, yet others were able to see that as an opportunity and they have adjusted their business models. They also rely on social distancing and technology to give people an illusion, a sense of belonging, belonging to the group where they can do stuff on their own while still connecting to others through technology, right? So changes in the general, uh, in the general environment are key uh, to being able to plan the future for the firm. Now, with respect to internal environment, I have said that culture is extremely important. It is hard to define. And uh, the, the, probably one of the better ways of uh, making sense of organizational culture is looking at its artifacts, right? Things that kind of define culture, that reveal culture to us. And among those artifacts, several are especially important. So many companies have their heroes, right? People who, have, uh, who are seen as either creators or, or people who brought the companies back from the brink of bankruptcy or dissolution. So you think about Apple, Steve Jobs was definitely, well, he was definitely not the easiest person to work under or work with, but he was the one who created the company initially, 
who made it, uh, a, success, a very successful business. Um, he's done very well for himself as well, but uh, you know, within the company, he's seen as this kind of a hero figure. You probably also know that at some point, Steve Jobs was let go of his own company uh, because you know he was not controlling the company. He was he was a shareholder, but there were other shareholders who outnumbered him. And at some point, he was basically ousted. And uh, when Apple got in trouble and wasn't able to resolve the troubles themselves, he was brought back. He was able to turn the company around. He launched a great number of new products and the market recognized that and loved the company again. So he would be seen as a hero figure. And many successful companies have those hero figures. Having them, having people identify with those hero figures, having them appreciate and respect those heroes is essential to forming an organizational culture stories right most companies they do share some stories there are some events from their past that explain how the culture was shaped how the company came to be those stories also tell about the values of the company the values of employees and as people identify with those stories they are more likely to display certain behaviors you sort of know what to expect from them in different situations. And, uh, you know, stories are essential. Uh, slogans, obviously, this is just a, a short, like almost a PR uh, expression of the values that the company stands for. And it helps because uh, if you can find those pointers that suggest what your culture really is about, that is helpful not just for you within the company, but for the outsiders as well. You know, if you think about Google, for the longest while, they had this official motto, don't be evil, or don't do evil, whatever it was. So for people who would join Google, it was absolutely essential to know that they were the good guys, that they would never abuse the technological power that the company has created for itself. And uh, that brought a certain kind of individuals to work for the company. Interestingly enough, that company has actually done away with that slogan several years ago. I don't know exactly the reason for it. Uh, I may speculate, but I didn't want to. So uh, now it is not an official part of their organizational culture. So I think that tells you something about the company and it definitely gives you some, something to think about. Symbols, rituals, and ceremonies. So those are kind of, again, pointers to what the company values and, and, and official recognition of certain kinds of behaviors and um, something that people adopt as important to them, as meaningful to them. It, it creates this organizational spirit, if you will. So people share those values, they engage in those behaviors, they have those rituals or ceremonies within the firm. And that's important for the people to really feel, have a sense of belonging to the company, right? So that's why uh, we pay attention to that. Organizational culture can be seen, observed uh, at several different levels. Uh, and we specifically identify three levels, uh, behaviors, values and beliefs and assumptions. Some of them are clearly visible, like behavior. When you work with a company, you see how employees behave, you know, you just know what to expect. That is the, the most visible manifestation of organizational culture. The way you treat it, the way you greet it, uh, the way that customer service works, I think that differs greatly from company to company. And that is the, you know, the, the facade of the company that others would judge that company by. Values and beliefs is something one level below the behavior. Right? So your values and beliefs shape your behaviors but you do not exactly observe those values and beliefs. You can infer them from companies' stories and from companies' heroes, uh, and maybe from um, uh, some ceremonies to see what, what 
what is important to the company and to the employees, but it, it's fairly hard to capture, right? So this is something that determines your behavior, but by itself is hardly observable. Finally, assumptions is something that's even one level below values and beliefs. Those are the things that we as employees take for granted. Those are the things that shape our values and beliefs, right? We just believe that the world operates in a certain way. We may believe that, uh, you know, good guys never finish first. And if that's what we believe in, then, you know, our values will be shaped a certain way and that will affect our behaviors. Or at the same time, we may have this assumption that no matter what, you're just doing best and uh, that will obviously shape your values and beliefs in a very different way and that will affect your behavior in a very different way. So as you try to make sense of the organizational culture and you look at its manifestation, it's important to remember that it's not just the behavior, but that there are things that are more fundamental than that. Uh, organizational cultures could be different in terms of strength and health. You can have strong cultures or weak cultures, right? Some companies you really have everyone identify with their values. And um, it's, it's definitely, well, definitely. In most cases, that's preferable than having a company with a weak culture where people are just a collection of individuals who go there to get their paycheck and, and nothing else. In terms of health, you may have healthy and unhealthy cultures. And so if you think about strength and health as two dimensions uh, on which cultures may differ, you have four possible quadrants, right? You may have a strong and healthy culture, which is great. You may have a strong and unhealthy culture, right? So it could be that, uh, you know, employees feel very strongly that their, their customers do not deserve uh, good treatment. And no matter what you do, you know, you're not going to change that necessarily. We have this uh, Russian airline called Airflot. And back in the 90s, when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed and people started traveling to and from Russia, Western travelers who would take Airflot would constantly complain that flight attendants just don't smile. So they do everything, right? They, uh, they, they would seat you, they will serve you food and drinks and whatnot, but uh, they would just have this stone face and uh, that's that. And that was a very strong cultural element. So the company has actually hired Western consultants trying to change organizational culture. Those consultants came, they worked with the company for, a month, uh, for, for months and were absolutely unable to make meaningful changes. So as a result, the company just had to adopt an official motto. We do not smile because we're serious about making you happy, right? That was the best they could do. And uh, I actually went to the company website several years ago, uh, that is one of the stories that I like to share with my students, I was able to find it deep on their website. So it, it is actually true, right? It's not just one of those stories. It, it was officially declared, they have used it for a while. And then I think over the years or rather over the decades, uh, as culture has loosened up somewhat, it became unnecessary to declare their seriousness about making it happy. So you may have a strong culture that is unhealthy and that is problematic. You may have a weak, healthy culture, which is not a bad thing, but so what you wanna do in that case is you wanna strengthen it and you strengthen it through several means and we'll talk about some of them in a second. And then you may have a weak and unhealthy culture in which case your challenge is, is twofold, right? You need to make it healthier and you need to make it stronger if you want to have a cohesive business where people care about what they do and are driven by you know this overarching mission that is beneficial not just for you but also the shareholders the stakeholders and all the people that company may affect in its daily life so 
how do you change or rather how do you manage organizational culture? Um, it all comes from the top, right? So the importance of symbolic leaders who identify the culture, who, who spread the culture, who shape the culture is, is very hard to overestimate. It is, um, they're absolutely key to create in this cultural space, if you will. They typically do that through slogans, symbols, and ceremonies. And if you think about, uh, well, there may be multiple stories how those strategic leaders shape the organizational culture. Your textbook talks about Walmart and uh, how its founders used to travel every day to a new store and meeting with the people and observing what happens. And that will definitely communicate the sense of uh, responsibility, I guess, that each employee had for, for doing things right. Uh, you may think about Southwest and its founder, Herb Kelher, I believe the name was. And, um, you know, that guy stood for those exuberant happy values that the company is associated with. One of my favorite stories here is this Japanese company that uh, back in the 70s, I believe, or maybe even 60s, uh, just won a huge contract for supplying uh, certain kind of cables to a US manufacturer. So back then, Japan was not a technological powerhouse. They were just a developing country, not you know, long after losing World War II. So it was essential for them to, to establish themselves as a reliable player. And uh, let's say it's Friday night. Uh, they have to send their ship in on Monday. They got their cables and uh, they do the quality checks. And for whatever reason, uh, they realized that about 30% of their cables are bad. Right, so there was some process, uh, so, some technical issues in the manufacturing process. And it's Friday night and they have to ship it on Monday. So in terms of the choices they had, the choices are not great, right? They may contact the American partners saying, we messed up, we need more time, we have a technical issue, you know, give us another week. They may ship cables as is, and then sort of beg forgiveness and, and possibly ship more cables later on as they fix the problem, but that will send a terrible, horrible signal. So they chose to do something else. Every employee in the firm stayed there over the weekend, including the president, but going like as far down as the, the frontline employees and physically, manually, tested and checked each and every cable that would be shipped to the US just to make sure that only the good stuff was shipped. Now, obviously that initiative came from the top leader and he himself stayed there with the company, with employees doing that manual tedious job of testing and packing and everything. So that's the kind of behavior, that's the kind of signal that those symbolic leaders could send to their people that will shape companies' cultures for decades to come. And, uh, you know, supposedly the story goes, they were able to identify only the good cables and they sent those and the American buyer was very happy. And so they had established this uh, long-term and very successful relationship. You know, there are certain organizations that are called learning organizations that uh, make it part of their culture to continuously improve and adapt to changing environmental uh, trends. So, uh, you know, if there's anything you want to embed in your culture is this readiness to change. It's the build the willingness to change, if you will. And that is very essential. Um, in terms of business ethics, right? So um, it is expected that the decisions that uh, companies make or strategic leaders make are not only profitable, but also ethical. And it was less of an issue in the past where most companies 
saw it as their duty to simply keep their shareholders happy. The more money you make, the happier they are. So, you know, if there are some environmental considerations, you kind of just don't pay attention. Right now, ethical behavior is becoming a lot more important to businesses and customers and society in general. So ethics basically is about the standards of right and wrong that influence behavior. And there were several views of ethics, you know, what exactly would you consider ethical? So the utilitarian view, the right view and the justice view. Utilitarian view basically says that, uh, you know, the decisions that you make have to create uh, the most benefit for the most people. Uh, so you just try to, to, to maximize the utility. And if you've taken some economics classes, you, you, you know that utility language that I'm referring to. The rights view holds people and their rights as something absolutely essential. So whatever it is that you do, you do not violate people's rights. So uh, that becomes uh, a cornerstone of this approach to business ethics. And um, uh, justice view basically talks about the importance of treating everybody and anybody fairly with no prejudice, with equal rights. So uh, it's, it's much less about, you know, creating value or utility as such, as about treating the people with dignity and, and equality. So uh, that, those are the three basic views of ethics that you could see in business decision making. Yet, despite all the talk that ethics is important, people make unethical decisions and engage in unethical behaviors all the time. So why is it? And how do they possibly justify it? There are several standard justifications one, the most common is that, you know, everybody else does it. So you download pirate movies. Why do you do that? Well, everybody's doing it. Maybe you're not doing that, uh, but you're using someone else's Netflix account. All right, so why is it? Well, you know, people do it. It's not a big deal. And, you know, deep down, you know that, you know, technically you're stealing but you still do that because the, you know, how widespread that behavior is um, makes it seem sort of okay. When you think about your own driving, you know, there's a posted speed limit and most of us, if not all of us, would always go over. You know, you maybe go plus five miles, plus 10 miles, whatever the case might be. Why? Because everybody else does it, even though you know that this is the wrong thing to do. He also justified by saying, I did it for the good of others or the company. All right, so you sort of sacrifice this little nugget of possible goodness for the larger good, right? So, uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you treated certain employee bad, but you had some larger purpose behind it. Right, so that is also a rather weak excuse because fundamentally it is in conflict with the rights view, right? So you cannot do something that, that you know, violates my rights or, or someone else's rights, even if there is a major gain for someone else or for a group of people. Basically, you shouldn't be doing something that benefits someone else as long as it hurts at least one other party right so the good of others or good of the company does not cut it you may justify yourself saying that i was only following orders but i think we all know that uh, if the orders are clear or they're wrong then you should not follow them you should actually challenge them you say that, yes, maybe I did the right thing, but at least I did not do that. Right? So most people, when you ask them if they're a good person or a bad person, they would say that they're good. And um, when you ask them to justify it, well, they would say, well, I didn't kill anyone, right? Something like that. So it is clear that they have this reference point they compare themselves to, uh, you know, as someone who's done something really terrible. 
So at least I'm not quite as bad, which means I'm somewhat good. You try to uh, disregard the consequences. You say, well, it's all relative. You know, it's good in some contexts, it's bad in other contexts. If you think about companies who outsource uh, ecologically problematic manufacturing to third world, world countries that do not have quite so high ecological standards, well, clearly you're doing something wrong for the environment, but you say, well, at the same time, at least we give those people jobs, we're pulling them out of poverty. So, you know, people come up with all those justification for unethical behaviors, which essentially are just window dressing. Um, what are some of the factors that influence unethical behavior? Some of it boils down to the personality and attitudes, right? Personality traits. So some people are, if you will, just more likely to be inherently good or inherently bad. And there's nothing you can do about that. Um, then there's this idea of a moral development, a moral development stage. And we distinguish between three stages uh, on this moral development, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. At the pre-conventional stage, you try to do the right thing, not because you believe it's the right thing to do, but because you're told by someone whose authority you recognize. So with kids, you know, they would say, well, mommy told me to do this, or my daddy says that this is good or this is bad, and this is why I'm doing it. So there's not so much even understanding of the rules. You just do it because you're told to do it a certain way. Someone else defines for you what's good, what's bad. So that's pre-conventional. At the conventional stage, uh, you actually internalize those rules. You know that you know good people do this and bad people do that. You don't question the rules necessarily. You just know what defines a good person and a bad person, and you try to behave good because you know you like to think of yourself as a decent person. At a post-conventional level, here you actually start thinking about the rules. And you may come to realize that some of those rules are illogical or just plain wrong. So even though there is a law that says this and that, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this, you know, something that's definitely in opposition to the law, because that would be the ethical thing to do. So some of the factors, you know, some of the behavior that, that explains why you violate certain conventions has to do with the stage of your moral development. And uh, I mentioned here on the slide the Heinz dilemma. So usually when we meet face to face, uh, we discuss it with students in great detail. I encourage you to Google it. Uh, it's very easy to find. Uh, so the basic situation is that there's this guy, Heinz, and uh, he has a wife who is terminally ill. And there's a pharmacist who has developed this new drug and it costs the guy about 200 bucks to, to manufacture that drug. And he wants to sell it for $2,000. Heinz has $1,000. He, he tries to reason with him, the guy refuses. So he is considering whether or not he should steal the drug. And the big question is, will the decision to steal the drug be ethical or unethical? And uh, you know that, that discussion that we have in a classroom typically is rather fascinating. So I encourage you to read it. I encourage you to think about it and try to see how pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional thinking will identify certain behaviors as ethical or unethical. So th th that's just an interesting exercise. So I encourage you to do that. And finally, the situation, those same people could engage in different kinds of behaviors depending on the situational factors. It could be whether or not someone looks at you as you do that. It could be anything, basically, right? So, but it all depends, right? And it's very hard to predict. It's always easy to explain after the fact, but it's hard to predict how a person will behave in a situation without knowing all the factors that, that could 
define the situation in the eyes of that person. So how do you ensure ethical behavior? Right, so how do you even, you know, if it is impossible to predict, if people can behave different ways in different situations, how do you ensure that they behave ethically? Well, there are some well-known techniques that have been with us for, for millennia, you know, like the golden rule. Don't to others, you know, what you want them to do unto you. If, if you adopt that, then most of your behaviors will be inherently ethical. Uh, there are some advice offered by all the certain organizations like the Rotary Club, right? The way the textbook talks about it, they have this four-way test, like those four questions that you have to ask yourself before making a, an important decision. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? So obviously, if the answer to at least one of those questions is no, then that decision is not going to be ethical. So, uh, you know, you want to make sure that uh, you consider all of those elements, all of those aspects of your decisions as you make them uh, so that you, you know, so that you behave ethically. Uh, you try to adopt a stakeholders approach to ethics as opposed to shareholders. So here you understand that your responsibility is not just to shareholders, not just to your owners, but to all those people and all those levels uh, that are affected by your company, your customers, your suppliers, the environment, the employees, right? So you you have to understand that there's more to the organization than the bottom line. And if you do that, if you adopt the stakeholders perspective, then you're more likely to make decisions that are truly ethical. Um, discernment and advice. So basically, if you're unsure about the certain decisions, you may ask for advice from your superior. And the rule of thumb is, if you are hesitant about discussing your intended behavior with your supervisor, it's probably unethical. And then finally, companies may develop ethical guidelines. They may help you with making ethical decisions. They may help you with uh, ensuring your behavior is ethical. So they may have those guidelines explaining how to behave in different situations that almost takes the thinking away uh, from you. You simply follow the guidelines that ensure that your decisions will be ethical. Uh, companies may create those codes of ethics, which is kind of like those guidelines. They do provide training on ethical behaviors to their employees where they identify potential problematic areas and, and suggest certain kinds of behavior depending on the challenges that the employee faces. Ethical behavior definitely has to be supported from the very top and not just supported you know with words or, or policies or guidelines or codes of ethics but also with example uh, some of the corporate scandals that uh, we have seen here in this country over the past 20 years um, dealt with the very top level of management in companies when people misappropriate the resources, when they misrepresent what they do, when they force their employees to engage in questionable business practices. So, uh, you know, if there are unethical thinking elements at the very top, it's almost hopeless to expect that employees at the bottom of the organization will somehow behave ethically. You have to enforce ethical behavior. You have to be supportive of whistleblowing and you never penalize people for blowing the whistle. And um, you try to apply that same ethical framework regardless of the context within which the organization is embedded. And uh, what is considered ethical or unethical or, or you know, maybe corrupt differs greatly based on the country you operate in. 
So here in the States, we have this Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that specifically prohibits companies from engaging in what we consider unethical behavior when operating overseas. It may be, you know, like in some countries, it is okay to provide a bribe to the official to get a license. And now that act prohibits that outright. So you may be putting your companies at a disadvantage by doing that, by requiring that they keep to the you know higher ethical standard. But in the long run, policies like that are going to change uh, business climate around the world. So in the long run, we all are going to benefit. And it is important to keep in mind. So uh, just ethical considerations aside, uh, there is also this notion of social responsibility, which basically says that there are all those parties that as a company you are responsible to, right? So the stakeholders, employees, you have to provide them with safe working conditions, adequate pay, benefits. For customers, you have to give them safe products, you have to give them quality products. For the society, you have to improve the quality of life and not destroy the environment that we're going to you know, give to uh, our children and, and children's children. With competitors, you have to compete fairly, right? You don't engage in questionable behaviors, you don't spread lies, you don't undercut them. You try to make sure that everybody is guided by the same rules and principles. With suppliers, you work in a cooperative manner. It could be that your supplier is not necessarily a powerful organization, but um, you, know, you do not abuse your power to get a preferential treatment just to make your shareholders somewhat richer, you look after their benefits as well. Uh, still, you know, you obviously try to provide reasonable profit to the shareholder, but it is not the cornerstone of your business, right? This is not the only thing you try to maximize. You have to be conscious about all those other elements you're responsible for, and you have to deliver on this multi-dimensional purpose. So with social responsibility, you're making a conscious effort to operate in a manner that creates win-win situations for all stakeholders. It exists at different levels. So social entrepreneurs try to do something at, you know, uh, as a startup, they, start, they try to address problems that existing companies and governments do not address. Existing companies do that through formally adopting corporate social responsibility policy and issuing those CSR reports where they, they, they tell to the public that, you know, this is what we do, this is what we stand for. So it exists at different levels. And then the CSR itself. There are different levels of CSR. Right? There's, um, we may talk about at least three possible levels of engagement with corporate social responsibility principles. At the minimum, you try to adopt this legal level of CSR where you do maximize your profits while obeying the law, right? So you're not breaking the law, you're not bending the law, you are compliant with the law and try to look primarily about the interests of your shareholders. In this case, it is the policymaker's responsibility to make sure that the laws specify all the things that have to be protected. The ethical level of CSR, here you think of profitability as well, while doing what is right, just, and fair. So it's no longer maximization of profits at all costs, you have to make sure that it is right, just, and fair for all. And then finally, benevolent level of corporate social responsibility. Here, you try to use your profitability while helping society through philanthropy. So this, this takes it one step further. You find social causes you, you support. You try to do something that is good for the society. Uh, you try to change even the society's norms with your donations. And arguably, 
if you look at what uh, some of the most successful entrepreneurs and companies in these countries do, uh, the Bill, and, uh, Bill Gates Foundation, um, they invest tremendous resources in underdeveloped countries trying to you know, bring them up to a certain level. So they don't do that because this is demanded. They don't do it because it's right, just, and fair. They do it because this is sort of an act of philanthropy. They use the profits generated by their business to do something that will transcend, you know, just the Microsoft or, or you know, what their shareholders could do on their own. They try to affect the society as a whole. And obviously, when we talk about situational approach to um, corporate social responsibility as well, we may say that you know, depending on how factors are aligned, here we emphasize the, the you know, ethical CSR and there maybe we may talk about benevolent, but, uh, you know, even though it all depends, it is always a good idea to be looking beyond just profits, to realize that you're responsible for a great number of other things other than the money and that, uh, you know, as, as an agent of the world benefit, as a business, you can do a lot. And then finally, sustainability, right? One of the buzzwords uh, in the economic speak today. Uh, that primarily refers to meeting the needs of the present without undermining the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this is why we talk about sustainable energy. This is why we talk about sustainable this, sustainable that. We don't want to abuse the resources we're given so as to rob the future generations from ability to meet their own needs, right? So it's, it is essential for us to meet our needs, but we have to ask ourselves about the price or the cost to future generations. So it's meeting the needs of the present without undermining the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And here we primarily, when we talk about sustainability, uh, we talk about what's known as the triple bottom line, sometimes referred to as three P's, right? profits, planet, and people. So you try to care for the natural environment, uh, which would be planet. You try to think of social welfare, which is people, and then economic prosperity of the firm, which is profits. So that's something that I want you to take away from this whole very short sustainability discussion. Again, there are many things you want to maximize as a company, and definitely it is not all limited to profits. And with that, my presentation ends. Uh, if you guys have questions, uh, please feel free to uh, email me. I will be happy to respond. And uh, otherwise, uh, this week you have a first quiz. It is open for you on Friday uh, all day long. So make sure you don't forget about that um, and enjoy the rest of the week. I'll see you next week.